Welcome to Rockstock Channel. It is April 11th, Monday morning, uh, but it's Monday evening Singapore time, and we're privileged to have Stu Crow, who is the chairman of Lake Resources and a non-executive director of Atlantic Lithium. So two lithium companies. Uh, what's your history? How did you get involved in these two very different projects? Six and a half years ago, I met a group of guys at a surf club for lunch, um, looking for opportunities in the financial markets because uh, we we were just, you know, kicking around ideas of what we thought was a great idea. And we'd, we'd just seen the Rockwood transaction go through um, for $6 billion, which was, um, you know, a fairly sizable amount of money in those days for lithium assets. And we just thought, wow, that, you know, that's interesting. And we did a bit of work on it. And it was amazing. You know, there were eight of us sitting around that table at the time and we passed the hat around and raised, I think, something of like $700,000 and, and sent Steve Prominence, who was one of the guys at the table, off to Argentina um, with a, one of the guys who went back out to his truck in the car park and came out with a satellite phone, pulled a credit card out of his wallet and said, right, Steve, yeah, get back over to Argentina and, and let's see what we can find. Because at that stage, the work that we'd done pretty much suggested that lithium was obviously in, going to be in very high demand and there wasn't a lot of it around. It was a very small market and it was one of the few markets in that battery metal supply chain that at that stage wasn't controlled by uh, China or China were very dominant across the EV space and the battery metal space. So we saw there was an opportunity there to, to get involved. And Argentina, particularly for us with Lake, um, was a destination that had previously been pretty much a no-go zone, to be honest. Um, you know, it had two periods of fairly strong socialist governments in place. The only guys in, in town doing anything in terms of developing a project were Orocobre, who persisted and persisted. And what we learned from that was the Orocobre lesson that they had very, very strong and very committed partners. And so that's where we've had that same motivation with, with Lake as we've built it to have very strong partners so that we we would become embedded in their supply chain. And that that's sort of what we've been working towards over the years. Um, and then in, in terms of Africa, same story. You know, the lithium opportunity was there. We had some really good access to project generators through the, the DGR group of companies. And they saw an opportunity in, in, uh, in Ghana there at Awoya. And we, um, we pegged that ground fairly quickly. And, have done a lot of work and built out quite a quite a beautiful little project there that's a very very good ore close to um, infrastructure very close to port and and every time we drill it we keep expanding the resource so it's just been a, um, a remarkable um, project and interesting to be in two jurisdictions both of which you know have been considered risky um, but yeah, it's, it, we just saw it as a real opportunity in the, in the we sort of saw where electric vehicles were trending and, and a very small market that there was an opportunity to, to get involved and, and secure some large, large assets. In full disclosure here, uh, Archie Equity uh, advises Atlantic Lithium. Uh, we're not involved at all in Lake um, and it's very much uh, the one that got away. Um, I would I would say you can't you can't win them all, but um, I remember uh, I know I met Steve Promnitz uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago um, at the Four Seasons in Sydney um, back in the day of you know gold and copper. I don't even remember what we were talking about then, but um, when I saw he was involved in Argentina, uh, when you first came on the scene, I felt you were like a little bit late, right? Because there was Neolithium and and a few others that were kind of ahead of you. And it looked like the writing was on the wall, like Macri was on his way out and Argentina was going a different direction. And you had somewhat kind of lower grade than some of the peers. And this was before people understood Lilac or um, you didn't even appointed Lilac or, or, or DLE. Uh, but then we reconnected again just before COVID um, when, you know, I'll put up a, a slide here of where your stock was at that point on fumes. Um, I think you had a convertible. Um, and I was suggesting to you that you should talk to Lilac and tell them to, uh, you know, convert, you know, take over your convert, you know, for project level interest when you were at that very low valuation. And 
they didn't hit the bid on that idea at that time. They did it later. Anyway, we were having, um, I remember we had a, a, a drink at Joe the Juice Bar, um, you know, on Sixth Avenue. And, uh, and then two years later, we, we, we finally saw you again. And uh, we were eating oysters at uh, my favorite um, Greek fish restaurant, Milos, um, not too too long ago. Uh, it was it was happy and good to kind of see you, but it was also extremely sad as we toasted to your good friend and and our uh, close contact, which we spoke about in our last video. You know, Vince Muscolo. Um, if you could just uh, talk a little bit about him and that, and you know, his his experience and background with it with this project and the, the cup of coffee at joe the juice bar was uh was one of those great moments in time i was in new york begging people to take a meeting with a 30 million dollar market cap and a three cent share price and it was it was tough and uh you were pitching us to get involved and we didn't have a dollar to spare mm -hmm. and it was a you know you say it was one you missed um you know but subsequently, you've come in and helped Atlantic dramatically. So, you know, it was just one of those moments in time where we just couldn't do anything. But, um, yeah, certainly those that was back in November, November 2019. And um, yeah, it was a tough time. I do remember that. And that's a period I sort of describe as the valley of death for, you know, small lithium companies who just, we just kept going. I mean, we just, friends and family just keep getting hit up for money to keep the Keep the momentum going. Keep the, the work happening at the at the um, on the ground, and and keep the studies going with Lilac so that we could participate because we could see what was coming. And you were right; we were late. I mean, we missed the whole all the heat in you know, 2015, 2016 when things like Pilbara were going gangbusters. We we had a huge market cap, and we we hadn't we had all we had was some assets. We hadn't done any work, and and we were valued at 100 million, I believe, at one stage. So it was kind of ironic, but. Um, obviously, that'll go in a heap over sort of 2017, 18, and 19, and, and it was tough. So, um, yeah, coming back around through New York this time, you know, it's not often you walk down Madison Avenue and have guys screaming out, hey, Stu, and rubbing up and high fiving you because they were some of the guys that bought, bought some stock on my last visit to New York. So, I've got a lot of new friends there. Um, like, we've, got a lot, we've got a lot of new friends everywhere, to be honest. We've got a great bunch of shareholders and it's been very rewarding but yeah and, and and as part of that trip you know we we you speak about vince you know i worked alongside vince i was one of the um early directors on on iron rich as it was then before we split into atlantic and and ricker um and vince was there and we had a, a very strong team of guys who we'd known we'd all known each other for a long time vince has been a, a very very good friend of mine for 20 odd years and i speak to him daily so left a real hole um, in my life and certainly um, it's tough you know you you, you have a, a working relationship with someone in a business sense but you know we had a lot of very close moments and things it's a really it's a really hard situation to come to terms with and we're now sort of scrambling to backfill because you know for a guy lived and breathed that company and those projects and and the effort he put into it was just incredible and then we're sort of tr scrambling trying to backfill that energy and the commitment and the hustle that he brought to that company and uh and we've sort of committed to deliver that vision um with atlantic as it is now and and work together to bring it all together and as you know we've appointed len then colf who's been the ceo for a number of years and worked very closely with vince so he's now stepped into the ceo role but you know, it leaves a big hole, and and where you know it's it's not easy. You know, you, I sort of look at my phone every night at around ten thirty or eleven o'clock, waiting for it to ring. Um, but we've just got to move on and deliver, you know, his legacy and and his vision. So yeah, we miss him greatly, and uh, particularly coming up, we're heading to Indaba in in early May, and that will be a very different conference for us there this year without him there. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to um, uh, toast with Rodney um, uh, there. Um, okay, Rodney. Uh, well, thanks for for that. And yeah, we we miss him, and we we had an opportunity to speak with Len and and you and and the chairman Neil last week. So um, to be continued as to you know what will unfold there. I mean, you did announce uh, Rodney. We'll we'll talk about your recent announcement about. Um, you know, the inbound interest uh, that you've received 
If you look at uh, Atlantic Lithium and particularly the IWA the project, it's infrastructure blessed and it's fully funded and hopefully will be a near term uh, producer. You, do you think that it should be closing the valuation gap with the likes of core and other eminent uh, spodumin concentrate producers, especially as uh, secondary listing on the A6 is on the cards? Well, that's a hope, um, Rodney. It, it, you know, at some point, your reality, reality has to set in. I mean, you know, I guess we've been marked back because we're, you know, people are un, un, unused to, you know, not used to seeing projects of this site, type in, in Africa. Um, and, you know, people have been mining lithium in Africa for a long time. Um, this one sort of come onto, the, onto everyone's radar fairly recently. I, I think the rate at which it's been expanding and that we've been able to expand the resource there is, is probably starting to get a lot more attention. But, yeah, you look at some of the valuations in other jurisdictions, um, and you mentioned a few there in Australia, we'd love to get in amongst and have some, you know, comparative analysis done and, and valued against those guys. Um, and, and notwithstanding anything those guys have done, they've done a remarkable job there with, with both Core and, uh, and Liontown and, um, yeah, congratulations to them. But I think what we have there at Awoya and, and as you say, with the proximity to infrastructure and the ease to get that to market, plus being fully funded into production with our partnership there with Piedmont. I mean, that's a very powerful combination of, um, circumstance that I think will will go well, and I suspect the ASX listing um, should be very well received. In, in fact, we, we are getting um, very very high levels of interest in in participation in that, and and people constantly trying to work out when and if, when that's going to happen. And I mean, so I, 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 we are sort of sort of sort of bit, bit after mid year, so that's the sort of current timetable. Is, is that the time to timing just after mid year? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, all these things are, you know, subject to a whole range of different things that can come out of left field or, you know, you miss a deadline here and it may push over a week or two. Um, but yeah, somewhere around sort of mid-year, maybe sort of July, August, let's see what happens. But we're sort of pushing it pretty hard. There's a lot of interest in it. Yeah, well, that's, that's exciting. I think we, we agree. I mean, the other thing um, we've discussed and contemplated is, you know, you talk about jurisdiction, but as it happens to be in Ghana, which we consider Africa light. So, you know, now that with the things going on in Mali, I'd say it's number two now behind Botswana, but, um, you know, you now have the opportunity for both Chinese and non-Chinese potential buyers to compete for the assets. So there's no restriction as there would be in some of the other locations. So, I mean, if anything, that should hot up the competition for the asset. Yeah, indeed. And and we've seen some fairly aggressive moves in, in Africa generally um, by a number of different parties. And I guess it's to be expected. I mean, lithium is in a massive deficit. It will be for quite some time. Um, we're seeing, you know, a lot of interest in, in this project, particularly in the light of its recent expansion. And the fact that we're looking to continue to drill that out and, and our confidence levels of increasing it even further are, are very high. So I think it makes sense for someone who's looking to get a near-term producer close to port with all the roads, highways and, and power really within, you know, not that far from the project. It's a pretty easy project by comparison to some to bring online. So I think it's, it, it, it's worthy of the attention it's receiving. And so, I mean, that other thing, of course, uh, Stu, is you know, you've the access to drill rigs and so on is compared to elsewhere, you know, in terms of drill and assay is you know, something not to be overlooked. Oh, indeed, I mean, yeah, absolutely. We have we have a great relationship there with um, our drillers, and we would anticipate we'll, that will continue for some time. Um, and yeah, you're right, there, there is there's good, good access and some of the other places we're operating in, in a whole range of other areas, um, not just lithium, is, is, it's very difficult to get rigs at the moment. So, I mean, if you look at how little of the total tenement size in Ghana 
that's been drilled. Um, we're likely to see, you know, a major expansion in resource size in the coming months, uh, an extension of, of mine life. The sort of watershed might be around 20 years. You know, once that's achieved, you know, is it possible that Atlantic and Piedmont could elect to expand production over the sort of anticipated 300,000 tons of spodgeable now? Is it possible? Is the infrastructure there, you know, can it be done? Yeah, I, I would. I, it, my, my my opinion is it is yeah for sure. Okay, because I mean, obviously you know that that again moves the needle on on NPVs. I guess if you can up that because it's a DMS only, the capex is not material. No, it's not. It's well, not at, not at these price points. It, it it becomes increasingly less material, doesn't it? It's um it's a fantastic situation to be in. And that's why I say, I mean, it, it, it makes sense to push it as hard as you can in this current environment. Yeah, so that's something, you know, Howard and I have talked about and we, we presented it at various conferences. And I think, you know, if Atlantic can get up and running by 2024, you know, is how steep is the backwardation in, in lithium and spodumin concentrate prices as we go out along the years? And by that, I mean, uh, what is the forward implied price, you know, in, in companies? So in iron ore, in nickel, in copper, we have established futures curves that tell you where supply and demand should be and, and, and uh, market participants can have a look, whereas lithium is more opaque. And we think, Stu, if you look at some of the broker forecasts and so on, I just, I, I don't know how it's conceivable that spodumin can be $1,500 by next year. I, um, I would challenge anyone who thinks that spodumin will be $1,500 next year. I, I, I'd love to know where it's coming from because everything I see indicates that it, the expansions globally are at, uh, at risk. You know, you've got massive dis dislocation of the supply chains globally. That's slowing projects coming to market. You've got political instability in some areas where expansions were expected. Well, those expansions may happen, but they're probably going to happen you know, down the track. They're not going to happen this year or next year in any, in, certainly in some areas in South America. And, and you know, it's, uh, the conversion capacity, is it there? I mean, you can go and, you know, and you've seen Min, Min Reza talking about stepping up their, their opportunity there. That's fantastic because at least, you know, they can actually do that but that's not going to solve the problem um the demand that's also, you know i think people also need to understand green bushes is one thing wadrina is a whole nother thing yeah and that's un, you know that's non-established material yet they never actually got it up and running in any decent size before they put it in care and maintenance so i think it will get there but to think it will get there immediately is ambitious sure and but those guys are good operators but even if you assume it does get there, it still won't be enough. I mean, you've got a situation here where you've got an exponential growth in demand and uh, the supply response is at best linear and maybe it's 10 to 15%, but it's certainly not 20 or 30% growth in supply. So you're gonna have deficit for, well, I, my personal view is 15 plus years. Um, I'm happy to have a fight, but, I'm very comfortable that we won't see 15,000 tonnes a year. I don't think we will probably, as a long-term price point, I can't see that that may never be the price. I think it'll be a lot higher than that for a lot longer. Yeah, look, I think, you know, um, if I remember correctly, uh, Atlantic used 900 or 1,000 in its latest iteration of the NPV. Um, my view is that uh, we will be in the most critical early years when it makes the most difference to NPV, we will still be a trading at higher prices. We'll see how, how that plays out. But I think if you load, you know, 1500 or 2000 plus for five years, instead of a thousand, it makes a material difference on the NPV. Yes. So, so let's see, I, I would agree. Uh, we've run a ruler over it unless, you know, Minres you know, really lets loose and uh, and gets the third train up and running and sells to all and sundry, you know, we, we still, we agree. We think the EV constrained number versus the unconstrained, we still think there's a material difference. So you need to bring on a lot more than that. So we would agree with you, I guess. 
the question then is, um, you know, is uh, as that plays out, you know, does that then give the bolster to, I guess, all companies, but in particular Atlantic, as you grow the length of the life of mine and you move the pricing up, mm. it's sort of, it could, you know, quadruple the NPV. That's just pure maths. I mean, that's just the way, that's just what's going to happen. I, I can't see how it won't um, because, you, know, you, you, you just look at this demand growth. The problem with supply is you, you simply can't just turn this stuff on and, and bring quality to market. The demand, okay, I mean, I, Stuart raises another sort of question is, you know, how much funding has really happened outside of the incumbents who can internally fund? How much money is really being put on the table? Yeah. And who's to blame for that? Because it's clearly not enough. No, it's nowhere near enough. And and that, that even now, if, it all, if someone threw $100 billion on the table and said, go out and build mines now, that might, that's not going to be in the market for four or five or even 10 years. So you've got that massive window of opportunity for guys that are near-term producers like, like Atlantic. And then if you look at, say, for example, you listen to the earnings calls of, just say, Tesla, you know, just under a million cars. They only did 25,000 of their Model X or their Model S combined last year. And the reason being, they don't have enough cells. And he keeps saying he's doubling contracts of cells from his suppliers, plus they're building their own. But they're cannibalizing, you know, by not by pushing out the uh, Model 3 and the Model Y, they're not delivering, they don't have enough cells to deliver, you know, the Cybertrucks and semis and their X and S. And then you've been, and then let's talk about energy storage. I mean, What's what's the demand for you know supplying massive batteries all over the place? No one sort of thinks much about that. They're all focused on the EV transition, but this is the endless demand. I mean, it's just fantastic for anyone in the lithium space, to be honest. And Atlantic and you know is sitting there primed as as is Lake coming up to production. Yeah, just picking on up on some of your comments about you know, Tesla and scaling. I have a tweet here from Elon Musk uh, from February, which says, I was at a lunch with Charlie Munger in 2009, where he told the whole table all the ways Tesla would fail. It made me quite sad, but I told him I agreed with all those reasons and that we would probably die, but it was worth trying anyway. So there are a lot of skeptics um, out there um, about DLE technology and here you are, um, you know, the market is clearly uh, making a bet that, uh, you know, there, there's definitely an opportunity here. And, and the, the beauty of DLE and what you're doing with Lilac or the potential of it is that you've put out this target 100,000 tons. I mean, to go from zero to 100,000 tons is an exceptionally Tesla-like, you know, ambitious target. And one could think, you know, maybe sound unrealistic, but um, we need all of those tons and it needs to be done in a in a scalable way, a faster way than has been done traditionally. I just listened to the yeah. Allchem call. They're expanding Olaraz and Saldivita, you know, through conventional ponds. Lithium Americas is using conventional ponds. Um, Livent, you know, has somewhat mixed, um, you know, DLE in their process, but you've had Pasco committing now to Argentina um, with their Paz LX process, which has been piloted for a long period of time. Rincon has been piloting for a long period of time um, in Argentina. And Rio Tinto is now talking about reworking that piloting. Um, and, and maybe in a few years that they'll they'll produce a few thousand tons, but by the end of the decade, they'll they'll be um, you know, hopefully at at scale. So here you are, Little Lake, uh, currently unpartnered. You've signed two very significant non-binding MOUs with Hanwha of Japan uh, and Ford of the US. You know, from Ford, I'm thinking, you know, from rubber plantations in Brazil to ion exchange, you know, DLE in Argentina. Um, we've been talking about Fordlandia, you know, for quite some time, but in the in owning, you know, mine. So going back to Elon and his tweet on Friday that he's going to need to own mines and processing. I think others like Ford will, will think that too. Um, 
So uh, there's a long lead into to a question. To, so but each of your agreements, so let's just talk about Hanwha and Ford, both non-Chinese, uh, but each of those agreements is for 25,000 tons. And you have articulated a first 50,000 tons. That's your plan. You've upped up your initial yeah. size. So that would mean that all of Lake's first 50,000 tons production would be allocated to just these two customers. Um, why was it important to announce these non-binding MOUs uh, rather than wait until they're binding? Because of their non-binding nature, we've got to be really careful what we say there because it is non-binding and nothing is agreed yet and it's subject to um, ongoing discussions. They are, in our opinion, material to, to Lake and, and, uh, and simply the scale and the opportunity that it presents. Um, and if you look at the announcement, um, particularly the Hanwha announcement, where they 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 talk about um, you know the opportunity to make a meaningful um, investment um, and put up some potential funding, such as uh, prepayments of offtake and other things, that helps us deliver you know the, the potential of these projects um, and and put us in a very strong position to to get to final final investment decisions. So. It's the first time I've seen Ford's name tied to anything. Uh, it's the second time I've saw Hanwha, like we did work with back in Nora, and I yep. remember they before Ganfeng took over um, back in Nora, Hanwha was very critical in that they are a trader and a supplier to the entire Japanese and other um, supply chain. So. It was a big validation for Bakanura that the clay process worked because they took their battery quality carbonate, put it with all the customers in Japan, and um, and they liked it and it worked yeah. and 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 that's what got them to binding and some financial support. I think they wrote an equity check into Bakanura. This was before you know Ganfeng happened. You know, thus far. All of Catchy's brine has been shipped and tested at Lilac's operations in California. Lilac's pilot plant is now in transit to Argentina. Uh, will this be the first time Lilac has built and tested a pilot plant in Argentina? In Argentina, as, as far as I know, yes. Right. You know, we, we were going to have the pilot plant on site, but during COVID, it just simply wasn't possible with with people moving we couldn't get people down into into argentina because of covid um and so it just made sense then to build the pilot plant in the oakland facility at, at lilac's facility there and ship the brine so um we did that and we we've, we've shipped a fair bit of brine up there and run those tests like we've got a fantastic data set we've been doing bench scale testing and pilot testing for now sort of coming on four years and there was the bench scale test ran for 18 months or so and then the, and the pilot Apart from a couple of months where that area was closed due to COVID, um, we've been running brines through the pilot for a you know good good period of time as well. So, you know, we've 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 built up a really high confidence level in in the process and and its ability to deliver. And I think yeah, it's fair to say that Lilac are following their um, work on pilot and bench and demonstration plant with a you know a potential equity investment following their equity, should they, if, you know, assuming they earn the equity, which I believe that they will, then they, they are on, they, they've stated that they're going to follow their money with an investment, um, which at $25,500 was up to 50 million US. And you could assume that that's probably a little bit more than that coming in at the 50,000 ton per annum level. So, you know, that's a fairly significant investment for a company that really is you know, fairly only just done a series B race. You know, it's a fairly young company. They've got to be, you would have to think they and their backers who are some fairly interesting and got to be, you know, they're fairly clever people. They've made a lot of money out of disrupting other industries and surprise, surprise, here they are backing a company that's looking to disrupt the lithium sector. So, you know, we're very comfortable with, with how this is shaping up and, and very excited to um, get it underway, to be honest, because... But frankly, we, we have people thought we were mad three years ago when we uh, went to market and said, oh, we're going to do this and 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 use a iron exchange program with some guys out of Oakland have developed a you know, really smart patent around some beads that goes in the modules. Everyone thought you're mad. You know, why don't you just do what you what everyone else has done? But sooner or later, you know, in a, in a it just doesn't make sense. 
to leave more than half your asset in your waste. Like the recovery of evaporation ponds sitting out there and you know, impacted by weather and everything else. You know, what do you get? 30 to 45% recoveries and the quality problems, you, know, you wonder why. And you, you know, it's using you know, technology that was invented thousands of years ago. Why not use some of the brain power that exists today and, and get a better result, recover? You know, we, we used 83% in the PFS. You know, that was when the price of lithium was three and four and five thousand dollars a ton at even sixty or seventy thousand dollars a ton currently or or more um or even thirty thousand dollars a ton it makes sense to rotate the beads more and optimize that process so that we can get a plus 90 percent recovery um why wouldn't you do that when the market's in deficit and still come in the bottom cost quartile if you, you've got to start to wonder at what point do some of these other operations get questioned by their shareholders. You know, what's going on? Why are you leaving so much of the asset at sixty, seventy thousand dollars a ton in your waste? Howard, if you if you're not prepared to challenge the conventional wisdom, you just accept what we've got and high water usage, damaging water tables, impacting local communities, and having a substandard recovery simply isn't going to cut the mustard when you've got people looking to buy an electric vehicle that want an audited supply chain based around ESG and sustainability. So I, I think you'd be surprised how many of the um, incumbents are actually testing um, other forms of uh, extraction. And I'm also aware that, you know, you've now got the big global environmental water treatment companies in the space. You've got Veolia, Suez, um, and a whole range of other guys out there. Schlumberger have got their own direct extraction process that they're in partnership with Panasonic. You know, there's a there's some big money coming into the space and there's a reason for that. Um, it's needed. There, there's, no, big, gonna... there's big money um, and uh, big government support. Even Jennifer Granholm uh, talks up, you know, geothermal in the Salton Sea uh, more than anything else. And your partner Lilac is partnered with Controlled Thermal, you know, one of the operators there. Again, still, yeah. still to be seen, but... Um, uh, uh, we need all of all of this to work. So just, just two two more questions because I don't want to take uh, too much time. Yeah. Just, I think you're but it, I make those guys wrong for trying to do something better. You know, it's it, there's a lot of people having a free swing at these guys. You know, standard lithium copped it for a while. We've copped it for a lot, but yeah, you know, we're just trying to make things better. Yeah, we've been optimistic generally um, in the sector, or just a, as a as a firm and as um, you know narrators and, and, uh, about the space. Um, it's easy to be a skeptic, um, and uh, there is undoubtedly you know hype and in, in in the sector and 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 people who do things in unscrupulous ways. You have not you know at all. Lilac is a very credible group, um, and you know we have to try. Um, yeah. So just like Calix, it, you know, for spodumene um, and what Ken Brinsden and Pilbara are trying to attempt there to innovate, sure. um, to increase recoveries and ship less waste, you know, hopefully that'll be a success. Um, okay. So Lake pre-feasibility study, I think, is like from 2018 or maybe 2019. You know, what's the timing of the definitive feasibility study? Yeah, that's um, still targeting third quarter this year. Um, and if, in the event that that changes, we'll notify the market, but we're still running on that timeline. We're looking to come to FID towards the end of this year. Um, we've got our financiers. We're sort of in, in discussions now with financiers on our export credit agency facilities. So there's a whole range of things being run in parallel. And um, at this stage, we're sort of looking and targeting end of the year for FID with construction, long lead items and things like that to be, you know, ordered end of 22, early 23, start construction at that stage. And targeting 24, um, you know, second half 2024 production and scaling to full capacity sort of early, very early 2025. So 2024 production. So, okay. I, I know a lot of your financing uh, and the ECAs that you've been you know, talking to. So I know there's a lot of ingredients there. And obviously if you can get Ford and Hanwha as partners uh, in, in binding contracts, they have very deep pockets to kind of finance this, I guess, what are the, um, you know, the pilots 
in transit. It's now April. You're saying a feasibility study, um, Q3, final investment decision, Q4. I guess, what are the gating items from the time the pilot plant arrives, right, to you're putting out that definitive feasibility study? Like, what, what, what should we expect to see over the next coming months? Yeah, the demo plant, the, the feasibility study is relying on, on the test work that was done at, in Oakland. Um, the, the demonstration plan is is more around um, lilacs earning and also being able to build and and ship larger samples to for qualification purposes <clears throat> and also just to you know there may be things there that you know obviously the point of running a demo plan is to see if there's any tweaks that are, are needed before we go into full full commercial scale production um, but the the um, the other things that are required, obviously, is permitting um, and environmental social impact assessment, which is underway. They're all sort of targeted to come into close sort of um, second, third quarter this year. Um, financial, that sort of moves along in, in tandem there. Obviously, offtake is part of those um, FID. Um, but yeah, everything else is pretty, pretty standard. There's nothing too tricky. Um, we are looking at sourcing where we're going to get our, our products from under the ECA terms. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting funding. That's that's coming in at the moment blended at sub 3% for a um, project finance in Argentina um, that's fixed, uh, a fair proportion of that will be fixed for eight and a half years post-construction. So yeah, it's pretty good money. Uh, on, on that, I, I was, um, when I looked at that, I know, um, Oracobre, or now Allchem, received very low cost funding from Japan, um, JogMec, because they had a Japanese partner. Uh, in America, you have the Loan Projects Office of the Department of Energy is now talking about, and a few companies have applied for that, but that's American money for American projects. Here you yeah. have UK and Canadian money for Argentine projects. Um, but that was Japan, Japan, US, US, like help us understand how that works. Yeah, that, that, that money is advanced um, and, and part of that is you source product from, from the jurisdiction where the money's lent. So we would look to buy a lot of equipment and, and uh, product from the UK and, and also the component that's coming out of the EDC yeah, Hatch, for example, is our lead engineer on this process, process and project. Um, they're Canadian based, so the, the spend we, you know, some of the the money that the ECA puts up will be spent back into into Canada. That's great. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, again, uh, a, a lake and an, an Atlantic Ocean of lithium. Um, two great companies uh, for you to be associated with, Stu, um, and, and much happier market times i wish you the best of success with with both of these and uh very much looking forward to you know the lake halo on the asx shining on uh, atlantic later this year uh, to help close that valuation gap we talked about you know with core lithium and uh lion town and a few others like sigma you know pure spodumene you know dms projects mm -hmm.